people will never see cash unless they visit a museum. Digital currency. Digital currency. Digital currency. Digital currency. Digital currency. Digital currency. Cashless society. Cashless future. Digital currency. And cash free. Cashless. Cashless society. A cashless society. Digital cash takes the, the worst of surveillance capitalism and the worst of surveillance state, merges them together in this fascist dystopia where every transaction you ever made tell something about your habits, your politics, your associations, your movement, your physical location. And on the one hand, all of this data gets collected and shared among all of the intelligence agencies and corporations, or leaked. And on the other hand, if the people in power choose to, they can decide to debank you overnight. They turn off the switch. Now imagine what happens if your bank account is shut down and cash doesn't exist. Well, you can't eat. You can't buy food, done. You can't use transportation. You can't rent an apartment. They can literally destroy your life in a second. This is happening today in China. Social credit score system rank its citizens based on their online behavior. The state will go over every detail of a person's life with a fine tooth comb, a financial situation, spending habits, career, even behavior on social media. People who have a negative credit score on that system are denied access to public transportation. They're denied access to airlines, they're denied access to trains, they're denied access to jobs in the government, they're denied access to apartments to rent. They're doing that today. Now, today those people have cash to go back on. What happens when there's no cash? This very misguided idea that if you eradicate cash, you'll eradicate crime which of course you won't because people will substitute cash with something else. And also, if, you, if the only people who are allowed to be intermediaries are the large corporations, they will commit the crime. It's like if you want to rob a bank nowadays, the best way to do so is to have a banking license. Then you can rob the entire bank and or country with complete immunity. If you rob one person and steal 20 pounds from them, you're going to jail and you're going to spend a long time there. If you rob two million people of their homes and mortgages, right, you're not going to jail. You're getting a 10 million bonus from the bank and you're retiring in peace and quiet in the countryside. I'll tell you a really, really important story about what happened to me recently, in fact, last week. I was doing a book signing at the conference and this guy comes up to me and he said, I was really touched by what you said and I want to share my personal story with you because this is very, very personal to me. He said, I have not been able to open a bank account in more than 10 years. Um, I'm Iranian. I was born in Iran. I haven't been to Iran in more than 15 years. Young kid who's in his 20s. Last time he was in Iran, he was probably like five or six years old. Maybe, right? I have a job, I pay taxes, I have a college education, I don't break the law, I'm entirely above board. All I want is somewhere for my, my company to pay my salary so I can have a debit card and buy groceries. I cannot open a bank account. I couldn't open a bank account when I lived in Malaysia for four years. I can't open a bank account now that I live in Germany for six years. Every bank I go into, the moment I say my name and they ask me my place of birth, they immediately stop everything. I can't open a bank account. It doesn't matter how many things I show them. I have no criminal record. I've lived in free countries for so many years simply because of where I was born, something I had no control over. And I have no association with anyone in, in this country. I have no association with the government, no interest in the politics, just because of where I was born. I cannot do, live my life, I cannot transact. You know, these people, through no choice of their own, have done nothing wrong. And the banks can simply say no, for no reason, without even telling you why. And that's it, there's, there's nothing you can do about it. And of course, when a bank account is now required to do almost anything, try renting an apartment without a bank account, without showing bank statements, or um, try running a business 
without a bank account. So you need an ID to get a bank account, you need a bank account to get everything else. But it's not a right, it's a privilege, and you can just cut off millions of people from access to the world economy. Make them non-people. A true peer-to-peer, -peer, or several, perhaps even thousands of alternative, peer-to-peer, -peer, digital, internet-based uh, currencies that do not belong or are not controlled by any state, any corporation, that are run by rules that are collaborative, that depend on the participation of all of the people who use them, and that give you complete freedom. P2P, or peer-to-peer, -peer, encompasses the ethos of this entire movement. It's about decentralization. It's about them not having an intermediary in between you. And I like to call traditional payment systems uh, peer to corporation to corporation to corporation to peer, where you didn't invite any of those three corporations into your transaction. They just injected themselves. So Bitcoin is a currency that exists on the internet, that is created on the internet, that um, really serves the needs of the internet generation. It does not belong to any government. It's not controlled by any bank. Um, Bitcoin isn't a company or product or a service. Uh, it's an internet protocol. It's a method of communication, just like we say the web or email, and that doesn't belong to anyone. It's a shared common public good on the internet. Bitcoin is a digital currency and payment system that is a shared good, um, and it is controlled collectively by the participants in the network. Bitcoin is a completely global and open system of money that anyone can participate in without asking permission, without registering for an account or uh, showing ID. Uh, all they need to do is download an app. Just like if you want to participate on the web, all you need to do is download a browser. If you want to participate in Bitcoin, all you need to do is download the Bitcoin wallet. And the moment you do so without registering with anyone or creating an account, you can send and receive Bitcoin. And why would you send or receive Bitcoin? Well, for many people who live in Western advanced nations who have debit cards and tap to pay, and it's not really necessary. But in a broader sense, we live in a world that is very fragmented, where money faces borders, very hard borders, strict lines of demarcation between countries and currencies. And you have these national currencies that are badly managed by governments and banks in countries where there is very little difference between a government, a bank, and an organized crime syndicate. All three are the same. The governments are organized crime syndicates. Zimbabwe, the banks, maybe, case uh, in point. And dozens of countries are like that. Right. And so what happens when they have a crisis is they take the entire population hostage with them. They shut down the borders. You. They create currency controls. You can't withdraw money from the ATMs. You can't exchange money for another currency. You go with the ship and sink down with it. And what's interesting is that Bitcoin is one of those things that actually offers a safe haven in that particular situation. But it also allows people who have never had a bank account to connect to a global financial system simply by downloading an application on a very, very simple smartphone or even using text messaging. There's more than four billion people who are in that situation. And Bitcoin gives everybody a currency that is open and global. It allows us to, to create a kind of unified financial system that exists outside of the mandates of government, that is completely private and is very empowering for individuals. It scares the hell out of governments that uh, find it peculiar uh, to have people in control of their own money. At which point you should really ask yourself, what kind of government is that that doesn't believe in freedom of association, freedom of expression, freedom of commerce? Um, that's more of an indictment of that kind of government than it is of, of Bitcoin. If your government is afraid of Bitcoin, you should ask yourself, what kind of government do I have?